is uh, New Swinburne uh, Centre for Transformative Innovation Public Lecture. Uh, before I begin, um, I'd just like to, on behalf of the university, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we now meet, both past, present and emerging. I'd also like to pay my respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of Australia and hope that the path towards reconciliation continues to be shared and embraced. Um, I'm Beth Webster, Director of the Centre for Transformative Innovation at Swinburne University. Um, and thank you very much everyone for logging into today's webinar to hear about Dr. Jane Oppenheimer. Uh, before we start, I'd just like to make sure that you're all on mute. Um, this presentation is going to be recorded and may be available later. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please write your questions in the Q&A box, which is a little tab down the bottom of the uh, computer screen. I will read your question out at the end of the presentation. If you would like to ask the question yourself, uh, you can, I can unmute you, uh, but you just need to raise your hand, which is that little hand icon down the bottom of your screen. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Dr. Jane Oppenheimer, who is the Scientific and Operations Director at Ego Pharmaceuticals here in Bayswater in, in Victoria. She's currently leading a team of 280 people. For more than three decades, she's led the development of dermatological products at Ego with five product ranges now, the market leaders in Australia. These include products for head lice, sun protection and therapeutic skincare. And as we've seen before, one of the major um, items that they run um, is hand sanitizer, which you'll be talking about later in the presentation. Um, she's run and now takes an active interest in also clinical and efficiency studies to support EGO's therapeutic claims. Previously, Dr. Oppenheimer has led and managed compliance with pharmaceutical regulations in more than 20 countries, including the UK, Middle East and Asia. She's also enthusiastic about sustainability and at Ego Pharmaceuticals, this means minimizing water and energy usage. Now she has a Bachelor of Science degree with honors in biochemistry and a PhD from Monash. And following her PhD, she worked as a postdoctoral fellow at WEHI in immuparasitology, uh, where she researched candidate molecules for a malaria vaccine. Now, before we hear from Jane, um, I'd like just ask, I've asked Tom Sperling, uh, Professor Tom Sperling, just to say a few words about surface and colloid chemistry in Australia. Thank you very much, uh, Beth, and welcome, Jane, to this, uh, this talk. So uh, Jane was the uh, 2019 Clooney's Ross Award Entrepreneur of the Year, and this is a lecture uh, connected to that, that award. And people who win the Entrepreneur of the Year Award have got to have played an integral role in the discovery and translation of a major, major technology-based products uh, that's led to some financial success. And Jane has certainly done that. Uh, her products have a number of different technologies, uh, as, as you heard from Beth, including um, um, immunology and, and, uh, and uh, biochemistry, but one of the inputs is uh, in, in any, uh, surf, any uh, uh, product that is uh, interacting with surfaces is of course surface and colloid chemistry. And that's an integral part of the ego pharmaceutical um, technology. And surface and colloid chemistry and its application to industry goes back in Australia a long way right at the beginning of the 20th century, Ian Walk was involved in the development of the flotation process for minerals. And uh, further along, Eric Hyman was uh, a German migrant to Australia just before the Second World War and developed the surface and chemistry group at Melbourne University and was the first person to think of use of uh, monolayers of some sort to control evaporation of dams and this was followed up in CSRO by Bill Mansfield in the 1950s where he um, he, he developed that uh, technology uh, to its use and this is followed in recent years by a whole group led by Tom Healy at Melbourne University in uh, maintaining Australia's excellence in surface and polar chemistry and that's a, a, an integral part of what uh, Jane 
does at Ego Pharmaceuticals. So I was extremely happy when she won the Entrepreneur of the Year Award. So thank you, Jane. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, thank you, Tom. I really appreciate that. And I have to say surface and colloid chemistry is just so important. Uh, really, really important to our sunscreen manufacturer, of course, where the aim is to get a, an even surface of sunscreen over the, over the skin. So it evenly uh, goes over the hills and dales of the skin. Um, but surface and colloid chemistry makes the difference between a product and a cosmetically acceptable product. You know, a real quality product, you have to understand the surface and colloid chemistry and you've got to have a really good basis of that. And uh, we make sure that we have a large number of people in our R&D team um, that are chemists with a good grounding um, in that area. And I believe that's what makes the difference with our products. Um, so, well, thank you everybody for joining. Um, congratulations for um, making the effort to get out of um, COVID isolation and come and join remotely um, to the wider world of science. I'm really hoping uh, that you will enjoy today's presentation. Um, I'm really hoping to just introduce you to Ego Pharmaceuticals and why, what I want to do is to uh, showcase a $20 million facility that we built back in 2016 um, that has been uh, vital uh, to help uh, in Australia's fight against the COVID-19 COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, by producing the, the Acrium hand sanitizer. So, so I'm really hoping that uh, you'll enjoy all the science and all the engineering uh, that goes into making of this product. But, uh, so are we ready now to watch the video? But, uh, I've, I, I've made a, a video um, to uh, actually walk you through uh, the, how we make Acrium hand sanitizer. I'd like to take this opportunity to speak to you today about advanced manufacturing in Australia. I'm going to walk you through how we make Aquium hand sanitizer, very topical for 2020, while we're all adapting to the COVID restrictions. Behind this bottle is a great deal of complexity. Aquium is a therapeutic good. It is supplied to hospitals and healthcare workers, as well as to pharmacy, and thus must be made under the rules outlined by the Code of Good Manufacturing Practice. To make this a little bit more interesting, Aquium is also a flammable product. I'm going to tell you about how we have advanced manufacturing in a hazardous environment. And to do all this in one hour, I thought I'd take the opportunity to give you a virtual tour of our flammable facility at Ego Pharmaceuticals in Brayside, Victoria, Australia. My name is Jane Oppenheim, and I'm the Scientific and Operations Director of Ego Pharmaceuticals. My studies were in science, specifically biochemistry, and for 20 years I led the scientific team at Ego, and this included areas like research and development, quality and regulatory affairs. For the past 10 years, my work has focused on developing Ego's manufacturing facilities here in Australia. Some of the major projects have included expanding the laboratories, the plant room and the offices. I've also overseen the construction of our global head office and distribution centre, including a 1,000 pallet storage facility for flammable product. Of great interest today, I have overseen the construction of a flammable manufacturing facility. What I enjoy most about my work has been, firstly, to develop a team of professional and enthusiastic Australians that want to see manufacturing stay here in Australia. Secondly, to develop facilities and fill them with advanced manufacturing equipment. We strive to be at the forefront of advanced manufacturing technologies. We expect that through automation technologies, we can make the most profound difference to our own success and to Australia's competitive global position in the future. And thirdly, we want to be a leader in sustainability. Throughout all of our projects, we aim to minimise our water usage and use recycled water and rainwater whenever possible. We work towards renewable energy sources with the expectation of our manufacturing facility being self-sufficient with respect to electricity. 
and we minimise our waste, particularly the single use of plastic that both delivers our ingredients and presents our products. In addition to our Brayside site, which contains all of our production lines, we have a head office and distribution centre at Dandenong South. We've been operating since 1953 and our current product range consists of over 100 different formulas in 1,000 different product combinations. We sell our products to 24 nations across the world. We sell dermatological products that improve the lives of people through the science of healthy skin. Here's Kate Ritchie to tell you a little bit more about what we do. Like everyone, I play a lot of different roles in life and each one has an impact on my skin. There's work me, mum me, workout me, and weekend me. My skincare needs are always changing, but my brand never does. Originally developed for the Queen Victoria Hospital, QV are the experts in care. There's a QV for every me. Okay, so let's start our tour of making Aquium. Firstly, bulk ethanol has to be delivered to our factory. It has to be transported by certified operators. A sample of the ethanol has to be taken and tested by the laboratory to ensure it's the appropriate grade. This is done while the tanker is on site and takes less than two hours. The equipment for handling ethanol needs to be explosion rated. There are a number of safety systems in place to ensure the ethanol is delivered into the tanks without incident. The total quantity of ethanol in the tank is controlled by a limit set on how empty the tank must be before the delivery can be started, but also an upper limit on how much ethanol is allowed into the tank. As ethanol is pumped into the tank, air has to be released by a hazardous area ventilation system. To prevent cavitation, each tank has to take in air as ethanol is dispensed. Fine microbial filters are used to ensure no particles of dirt enter the tank. Uh, my name is Michelle Zorzi and I'm the production manager at Ego. We have three uh, bulk raw materials. They are glycerin, liquid paraffin and ethanol. The bulk tanks range from 18,000 litres for liquid paraffin up to 24,000 litres for glycerin. The bulk tanks are a huge advantage over our old system of 200 litre drums. My name is Michael Langford. I'm the logistics manager at Ego Pharmaceuticals. I have responsibility and teams based at both Oppenheim Way and at Brayside. Bulk delivery of ethanol, liquid paraffin and glycerin are delivered via tanker and pumped from tankers into large stainless steel tanks. There's two tanks of both liquid paraffin, glycerin and ethanol. We empty one tank, move to the next one and get a new delivery of, of that material. To receive the equivalent amount of a bulk delivery in 200 litre drums, it would take the inward goods team, one person would take seven and a half hours to unload, check, label, uh, put away in the warehouse and then deliver to production. By comparison, the equivalent bulk delivery would take around 45 minutes. From a safety perspective, it uh, reduces the number of uh, pieces of equipment we're moving, and every time we don't have to move a pallet, it takes risk out of the uh, out of the process. It saves QC sampling time. A typical delivery in drums would require 10 QC samples, and all of those had to be tested. Now, with a bulk delivery, we only need to have take one sample and test it, so it's much quicker. Working with the bulk tanks avoids wasting around 30 tonnes of material per year as the residual product is able to be reused. The system is much faster, more environmentally friendly, safer and is able to expand to meet EGO's future needs. There are regular maintenance activities in line with the Australian standard for hazardous areas, ensuring that we have regular inspections and replacement of components by qualified hazardous area technicians. Hazardous area technicians must be qualified electricians and have accredited certification. Hazardous area engineers that do the design and classification of the area must be accredited and have a number of years experience with hazardous zones and explosion proof equipment. So once the ethanol is received, it is pumped over to manufacturing. Let's talk about the manufacturing equipment. It consists of a sophisticated mixer and a side vessel. It also automatically dispenses ethanol and water. Other similar mixers are connected to a bulk dispensing plant 
that delivers seven additional ingredients directly. A system that we have that falls halfway in between our bulk tanks and our 200 litre drums are what we call IBCs or intermediate bulk containers. These IBCs hold 1,000 litres of raw materials. The IBC system was designed and custom built for EGO to suit our needs. So my name is Glenn Fleming and I'm the engineering manager for projects. So EGO has designed a central area and connected pipes from an IBC system where all these bulk materials can be connected and connected them to various mixes in the plant. We have two forklifts that we're capable of lifting up to 11, 1200 kilo, which is what an IBC can weigh, uh, up to the IBC platform. The IBC platform is equipped with a safety turnover gate. We lift up to the platform and somebody from manufacturing needs to be there to pallet jack that uh, stock away and change the gate over so we can put the next one up. We also gave consideration in the design to the ergonomics for the operator. So when the operator is connecting up a new IBC, the connection point is actually at a waist level for them, so they don't need to bend down and risk a back injury. My name is Ewan Dowie, I'm the Manufacturing Manager at Ego Pharmaceuticals. So the IBC system is much um, easier to use, it's basically you press a button and it's automated and it, the, the right quantity comes in into where you need it when you want it. Um, so that's quite neat, so we don't need to get someone to manually weigh it out, make sure it's ready on time. Some of our products use significant amounts of head jelly, now we've got four preheating stations upstairs as well as the two live stations. So previously that couldn't have been done, the hot rooms just didn't have that capacity. So now we can do longer runs that are more efficient so um, we can become more competitive on a global stage, so that, that's quite amazing. The mixer has a side vessel, and this is important. It allows us to make sophisticated emulsions by making the water phase separately from the oil phase and then mixing them together to get a more stable emulsion by getting a very small droplet size. It also allows us to make a premix and put this into the side vessel. Then we meter back a portion of the premix into each batch. The process allows efficiency. Most of the ingredients can go into the concentrated premix. This way, we can get a good emulsion of these ingredients. We're also making one premix for 10 batches of product, and therefore we limit the dispensing each time. Instead of dispensing 10 times, we dispense once for 10 batches. Once the premix is measured back into the main vessel, it's simply a matter of adding ethanol and water and then thickening the batch. The premix may take two people half a shift to dispense and one hour to make. Each batch can then be made in about 30 minutes. As the mixer and side vessel each have the capacity for two tonne, we can make about 20 tonne of product in an eight hour shift or 60 tonne of product in a day. All parts of the mixer have to be rated as zone one and thus everything that moves and measures has to be explosion proof. To minimise the hazards and the costs, we have kept all the big equipment that we can outside of this rated area. So equipment like the compressors and the vacuum rated equipment and the electrical distribution boards are all housed in a separate room behind this zone one area. With the space that we had available, we had to design everything in 3D. Um, it, it would not have been possible for us to do basic 2D layouts and fit the amount of equipment we have in such a small space. So we worked quite closely with the architects at the time. We modelled everything in 3D. We worked with consultants who helped us design the manufacturing plant. And then we also worked very closely with the architects. And we went, went back and forth a lot. And there was a lot of negotiation, working out where we could create space and where we could give up space so that we could fit all of the HVAC equipment in so that we could allow the right height for the building. It, it was a very lengthy and detailed process. To comply with Australian laws regarding hazardous areas, we had challenges to ensure that every component met regulatory requirements, in our case IUCEX. The special challenge is a lot of our machinery is not available in Australia, so we have to buy them from Europe, Germany in the case of the mixers. The benefit we also had from that though is some of the European requirements that aren't in our standards yet, which have greater protection, so we got to pick the best of both worlds. And so once the product is manufactured, it's transferred to one of six storage tanks, each with two tonne capacity. This allows us a buffer for the filling process, as well as time to get the product tested by quality. Being a therapeutic product, each batch has to be tested for the active ingredient, in this case, ethanol. Each storage tank is independent of each other. The operator uses a human-machine interface 
to identify which tank the product is to go to and to be dispensed from. It's possible to have a different product in each tank, although this is unusual. Many times we simply have aquium in every tank waiting to be filled. To allow for this flexibility, there's 1.2 kilometres of pipework in the sealing space. So once we've manufactured the product, we need to clean and sanitise the equipment. We have an automated clean in place system. We're able to clean any part of the equipment independently of any other part. We have three IBCs of surfactants that are connected to the system. We have cleaning recipes that allow us to dispense the correct quantity of surfactant into water at the correct temperature and send it to any one of our mixing tanks, our storage vessels, or in fact, the filling equipment below. To help clean the 1.2 kilometres of pipework, we have a picking system that pushes Teflon coated ball bearings through the pipework to eliminate the product waste before the washing starts. Here's one of our engineers, Keith Roys, to tell you more. The pipework going between the mixer and these tanks has a almost like a rubber plug that gets forced through the pipework, pushing all the product down towards the tanks so that we have less waste and more importantly, we're not putting ethanol products to the sewer when we do a cleaning job. Previously, however, we used to have to dismantle machines, lift the lids off, sometimes take large components off to a wash bay where they were washed manually with high pressure hoses, brushes and people having to add all the detergent manually. The big benefit we've got now, of course, is because it's an automated process, we can also set up a queue. So instead of one machine being washed at once, we can set up every part of the machine that was used in the last process to automatically wash one after the other and operators can do more valuable work. For our next, even more complex machines, we're looking at an ice pigging system that uses crushed ice instead of Teflon coated balls. This is easier to adapt to intricate pipe work and gives a faster rate of cleaning. With both systems, our aim is to put less product and less water into our trade waste system. So all of these processes help drive safety as well as efficiency. As each tank is only two tonne, and we only need to allow for the spillage of one tank, this reduces risk, but it also reduces the requirement for bunding of the facility to two tonne. We have a two tonne spillage tank to do this job for us. We use discrete batches of two tonne, but we dispense for campaigns of 20 tonnes. And when we make aquium, we try and do campaigns that go for a whole week. This gives us the opportunity of continuously filling up to 400 tonne of product. The clean in place system means that we can clean at the end of the campaign, and therefore we can optimise the cleaning, saving manual handling, trade waste and water. After we've manufactured the gel, it flows from the tanks in the room above with a little bit of pump assist into a hopper of the filling machine. Now let's follow the path of getting packaging onto the production line. Packaging is received into the warehouse and the outers of the packaging are identified and labelled before sampling. Samples of each of the packaging items are taken into the sampling room and tested against a specific criteria. Packaging is then stored in the warehouse until it's required. When required, the packaging is put up onto the mezzanine area and taken into a deboxing area. The packaging then goes down chutes, one for bottles and one for caps, into the filling room below. The bottles are moved by a conveyor to an unscrambler, which places the bottles into pucks to present the bottles to the filler. The unscrambler has over 130 motors to allow it to adjust to bottles with varying capacities from 50 mil to one litre. The pucks allow a range of bottle sizes to be presented to the filler with a relatively short changeover time. Here's Glenn Fleming, Engineering Projects Manager, to tell you about filling with pucks. One of our more recent projects was a flammable filling line specifically for our Aquium products. One of the things we did differently on this line was we utilised a puck system. We analysed our existing lines and we looked at all the manual operations involved and one of the opportunities that we found was to minimise those manual adjustments by using pucks. Now, what the puck system allows us to do is to effectively make every bottle the same size. Instead of having to adjust between the largest and the smallest products, 
We don't have to do any adjustments. We just pick the pucks off the line and put the new ones down and that's it, we're done. As the bottle comes through in its puck, it is then filled and the cap is applied. The bottle continues onto an accumulator that collects 90 seconds of production to allow some short stoppages on the line without loss of production time. After the accumulator, the bottles are depucked and the bottle continues on to be labelled. Labelling includes a front and back label, as well as a batch code and an expiry code, which are printed onto the base of the bottle. A vision system is used to check the correctness of the labels, the batch code, the expiry date, and that the pack looks right. For instance, the cap is on correctly. The product is now sealed in its primary container and it's conveyed to another room to be cartoned, case packed and palletized. Automatic case packing and palletizing reduces manual handling for staff. The product is then stored in the dangerous goods warehouse while it waits for transport to the distribution centre. So in summary then, we present boxes of packaging to the line and take away pallets of product. We have connected over 20 major machines to do this. We measure overall equipment effectiveness to continuously monitor, measure and improve efficiency. We have a computerised maintenance management system to schedule and monitor all routine preventative maintenance tasks. We've started to implement predictive maintenance so that machines tell us when they require maintenance. The future expansion of this work will have both cost and environmental benefits. We will be replacing filters when we need to, not simply because it was scheduled. As an Australian company, we know all too well the severe effects of climate change, so we've been working hard to improve our environmental footprint. At both of our sites, automated reports measure and monitor our use of water, electricity and natural gas. This allows us to evaluate what we're doing right and what we can improve. We're constantly asking ourselves, how can we do more with less resources? We're really proud of a number of initiatives we've implemented to save water. Here's Reuben Walters, project engineer, to tell you about one of them. We use purified water here. We generate it on site. For every five litres of purified water we generate, we generate one litre of retentate, which is slightly salty water. This is still drinkable water quality, but we can't use it in our products. We need the purified water for our products and for sanitising our manufacturing vessels. But we can reuse the retentate in our wash water system. So we need to preheat it and to deliver it to our manufacturing vessels to use it for a first pass clean. This can save us up to 20,000 litres of water a day. It's our plan that in the future, our only use of mains water would be for our products, for our final rinse, and of course for drinking. All other forms of water for the site would come from recycled water. Water isn't the only thing we're saving. We're participating in an Australian industry group program to implement energy efficiency projects and embed sustainability into our company culture. Following the Paris Climate Accord, EGO is participating in the Take Two Pledge to fight climate change and play our part in keeping global temperature rise to under 2 degrees Celsius. We do this because we're a committed team of engineers and scientists that see this as essential for our company, for our country and for the earth. We have started an energy audit of current actions and opportunities to reduce energy use where anyone can contribute. We are changing our heating, ventilation and air conditioning system to be a more efficient, centralised system. We also use a series of dampness in our warehouse roof to release the hot air and bring in fresh filtered air. This allows us to keep our warehouse compliant with our product storage conditions of store below 25 degrees Celsius and store below 30 degrees Celsius in different parts of the warehouse. And this is without the use of any refrigerated air conditioning. Our biggest warehouse is 9,000 square metres and 13 metres high. So this is a very considerable saving in energy. We're installing more and more solar panels every year. 
We have plans to collect that energy into battery storage for two reasons. It would act as an uninterruptible power supply for the site, and it would allow our nighttime production to be essentially solar powered. Our target is at least a 7% reduction each year over a five year period in respect to electricity and gas use. And it's our ambition that with this development of these technologies, EGO may become self-sufficient with respect to energy in the future. I hope that you've enjoyed this virtual tour of EGO and a look at some of the projects that we've been working on. I wish you all very exciting and successful careers. Perhaps I'll see you at EGO in the not too distant future. Thank you for your time today. Great. Thank you very much, Jane. That was a really informative um, video. Do you want to just uh, finish, uh, t talk a little bit about the business, um, you know, how it was established, when you got the capital equipment, the type of people you employ there, and the links into the scientific community? Well, um, uh, the company, the company was established by uh, my husband's father and uh, mother um, and uh, back in 1953, so yeah. over 60 years ago. Um, so we're truly Australian um, and we just keep growing. Um, we have a, a whole range of topical dermatological products. Um, Aquiums One QV is another one, a market leader um, in soap alternatives and um, products for sensitive skin. We're market leaders in sunscreens and uh, head lice treatments and uh, also um, uh, corticosteroid products, uh, products for the skin. So we try and do everything for the skin. Um, the people that we employ, well, we, we've um, a quite large company now. We have uh, well over 600 people. Um, that's split basically half into um, the scientific and operations and half into sales and marketing. Um, we have marketing, sales and marketing staff in uh, uh, 30 cities and 24 nations all over the world. Um, and uh, yeah, we do all of the manufacture here in Brayside um, in, in Melbourne. The, the types of people we employ here um, is very diverse too. Uh, we employ a lot of scientists, um, a lot of engineers, um, but also uh, we complement that with uh, supply chain professionals. Um, some of those are business graduates and some of them are accountants. Um, uh, and of course, um, marketing um, and uh, salespeople uh, on the commercial side. But, um, Why Melbourne? Why did the business start in Melbourne? Uh, well, that's where they were. Um, right. uh, my father-in-law was a German refugee, actually. He... he um, escaped Nazi Germany um, just by the skin of his teeth um, and went um, to school here and on to Melbourne Boys High School. And uh, then uh, after a short period of working overseas, he came back and established a fledgling company that has uh, been very successful. In fact, so successful in the last 30 years, the whole time that I've been working for the company, we've had a compound 13% um, annual growth rate. So um, our problem, which is a very nice problem to have, is constantly coping with our growth. And uh, so it's been, been a, a wild and exciting ride for me. It's uh, been great fun. Mm. So I imagine with a growth rate like that, you've depended a lot on getting into new export markets rather Certainly. than just domestic growth. So how has that occurred? What have been some of the processes you've gone through to get into those export markets? Uh, well, um, it, export's always been a big thing. Um, Ray and Gerald, um, my parents-in-law, um, uh, developed New Zealand and uh, Asia, um, Singapore, Malaysia, and Hong Kong. And Alan, when he joined the company, um, took, took on board um, that part of the company, and uh, he certainly expanded that greatly. Um, he went into the Middle East, um, and uh, started finding distributors in the Middle East, um, uh, expanded Asia more, and also uh, into Europe. And we sell in the UK, Cyprus and Malta. 
but I remember um, when Alan first went, well, it was 10 years, 10 years between um, Alan first uh, going to the Middle East and trying to find distributors. And uh, I almost immediately, uh, as soon as I joined the company, started the registration process of our products in the Middle East. But it took 10 years, 10 years to convince the um, Saudi Arabians to take our product. And we were told by various consultants that um, Saudi Arabia was the jewel in the crown. If you could get into Saudi Arabia, then you would, were seen as con um, considerable and, and um, wanted by the rest of the Middle East. And I have to say, the trick to getting into Saudi Arabia was to get, out, to get established in the UK. Uh, once we had um, both uh, Australian credentials and UK credentials, then Saudi Arabia took us seriously. And I don't think we realised that at the time, but you know, as soon as we mm -hmm. had our first products registered in the UK, um, everything just fell into line um, in Saudi Arabia. And then um, now we have 12, I think, um, Middle East countries um, that take somewhere like 40% of our products. So we sell a lot mm. to the, the Middle East. Mm. And what was your unique offering for the Middle East? I mean, what did you have that you thought maybe some European or American producers did not have? Well, I think uh, going back to, to Tom, Tom's comments mm. at the beginning, I think our products are based on science. We really, we really make our products cosmetically acceptable and very nice to use. Um, and therefore, if you use them, um, so that they're very sophisticated emulsions. In addition to that, they're made for people who have sensitive skin. Uh, and so the, the products, we're very, very careful um, that every ingredient is um, a BP or EP, uh, that means the British Pharmacopeia or European Pharmacopeia um, quality ingredients, and that there's really no contaminants that are likely to cause irritation and allergic reactions. So quality products that are ideally suited for sensitive skin is, is the real offering. And then products that um, treat a whole range of skin conditions. Um, so, so that's the offering. Why the Middle East? Um, the, um, to some extent, there was less competition from the big multinationals. Uh, in the Middle East, which uh, has allowed us to get established perhaps a little bit faster. Um, so uh, that, that has been a, 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 a philosophy that has worked for us. Although we have continued to expand our Asian markets um, as well as that. Mm. So um, you mentioned innovation and science. Do you have continuing links with research institutes or universities to continue to develop your products or? How's um, that working? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, it was particularly with our clinical trials. I remember I, um, we brought uh, the MOVE uh, headlight products to the market and that was done. It was a $5 million project that was um, funded um, or uh, supported by a start grant from the federal government. And we worked very closely with the University of Sydney, uh, sorry, the University of Queensland uh, that had a headlice colony. Um, and uh, we did our clinical trials and also our in vivo um, tests uh, or with the group from the University of Queensland. We've worked with CSRO um, with our sunscreens and uh, measuring the efficacy of sunscreens at different stages. Uh, we've worked with um, the Pharmacy College um, and in particular, uh, Professor Jeff Sussman, um, to really understand how our products interact with um, uh, diseased and damaged skin. And uh, we've got a clinical trial um, that we're undertaking right at the moment. We've worked with dermatology units um, to test um, the efficacy of some of our products, uh, in particular the ceramide products, um, to show that they are ideally suited for eczema. Um, so, all the, the all of the product claims on our packs are substantiated by either clinical testing or in vitro testing, um, or or you know the basically the gold standard for that type of testing. Um, so 
and, and that that is very different, of course. It may be a vasoconstrictor trial if it's a corticosteroid. It might be a deodorant trial if it's a deodorant. Mm -hmm. It might be an SPF test if it's a sunscreen. So all the claims we make are substantiated. And what are some of the biggest problems with dealing with universities or research institutes? What some of the barriers that, that make, make you hesitate to go back to them or, or start uh, a new relationship? I'm, I'm not sure. I, um, I don't <laughs> Be I, honest. <laughs> all, all the people that I've met have been really yeah. charming. Yeah. And um, I, uh, yeah, I, I think it's just finding a win-win um, mm -hmm. situation so that everybody's getting something out of the relationship. Um, I, I don't have any any hesitation of going to universities um, if I've got a problem. And, um, we're, we're always very interested and we're, we're always very busy and we always wish we had more time, but we're very interested in a lot of what the universities are doing. For instance, I know that there's a Monash project um, to look at um, making uh, or powering boilers um, from the sun, um, which are, I think is a really interesting project. And I know Swinburne's got um, a huge advanced manufacturing um, technology um, group there. And we've got quite a number of graduates um, from Swinburne and Monash. Um, and I, I really encourage those graduates to stay close to their alma maters to, to make sure that we keep um, current with, with a lot of the research that's going on. So I've got a couple of questions here. John Nime has said, does the Australian made reputation present a top shelf product range, uh, top shelf product image for your export markets? So is that a yes. plus or a minus? Plus. It's a plus. It no, a Australia has yeah. a very, very good reputation overseas. Um, and uh, that's something we trade off, and uh, that's that's just fantastic. Now, Australia is a very very good brand position. Mm. Okay. Um, so in addition, um, John Dean's asked, uh, can you give us some idea about the composition of the workforce? Uh, so, what proportion of tertiary educator or trade educator on skill? I think you mentioned earlier on that half your people were in advertising and marketing. Is that right, or sales? Yes. And yeah. Uh, about. Half of the team is yeah. commercial and half the team is scientific and operations. So I think I've got about 300 people now uh, yeah. reporting to me. Um, I have to say more and more, um, uh, more and more of our equipment is becoming advanced manufacturing equipment. Mm. Um, so more and more of our people in production, in manufacturing, and in the uh, packing hall um, are graduates. In fact, it's a great place for graduate engineers to start. Um, they learn a lot um, working on the line, seeing what the problems are, and uh, then they can advance quite quickly into production engineers. Um, and there's so many opportunities, you know, sort of like understanding um, uh, the paperwork and, and the process and, and uh, facilitating, you know, improved process or understanding the equipment um, mm -hmm. and um, helping to define a faster way of setting that equipment or maintaining yeah. that equipment. Um, and, you know, then they can um, move up from there into um, uh, reliability engineers and uh, or um, project engineers. Um, similarly, um, you know, um, many people have used the opportunity um, to get a job on the filling lines and then apply for jobs in our laboratories and move up that way. In addition to that, um, we routinely take on some students, you know, doing their mm. work placements. And uh, I don't know, somehow they always manage to stay on. I don't quite know how that works, but uh, yeah. That's, um, so you're, you're employing less and less unskilled labour over time, would that be it, right? Or it it works that way. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, more and more. You know, we need less people putting products onto the line, uh, mm -hmm. putting bottles onto the line, and we more and more we need more engineers developing the packaging um, equipment to un, uh, automate you know, it or, or, or automate those things. Yep. So yep. It, nobody's being put off. 
Um, but I think that gradually our workforce is moving towards trades and um, scientists and engineers. Um, but we still, we, we really value, we have many people that stay here for 20, 30 years and mm. uh, we really value all the experience that those people bring um, to their roles. So Andre Guy, uh, Guiax has got a comment. He says, thank you very much for your very informative presentation, Jane. In the context of manufacturing your products, how do you mitigate the risk of cyber security attacks due to rapid and wide deployment of industrial internet of things? I have to say we, ha we have an ICT team um, and uh, they spend a lot of their time worrying about cyber security. My involvement in that is I do the training they tell me to do. <laughs> um, but yes, mm -hmm. uh, I have to say cyber security is just one of those areas, unfortunately, that um, we have to be very, very yeah. um, involved in. It's not my field of expertise. Yeah. Um, and uh, But there is a lot of interaction between our ICT team and our engineering team and making sure that all the uh, computerised equipment um, can't be attacked um, and uh, there's appropriate firewalls in place and things like that. A lot of work um, goes into um, that, which is a shame because it's not really productive work, but it's mm -hmm. work that just has to be done. Mm -hmm. So I've got a comment uh, here from Federico Bigoni. Um, it says, thank you, Jane, for your talk. I've seen your scientists published in peer review journals. Uh, and he gives an example of one by Karen Grieve and Tanya Barnes. Now, why do your scientists publish? What, why, what, why is that part of your business model? To bring credibility to, to our products. We decided yeah. a long time ago um, that our tagline is the science of healthy skin. We are aware there, we're authentic. Um, all of our claims can be supported and to, um, to for veracity for that, we, we try, at, well, we, we don't try, we, we routinely uh, design our experiments for publications. Um, so this comes from, um, Karen Grieve has a PhD mm. in um, biochemistry. I had a PhD in biochemistry, our current, R&D manager has a PhD in chemistry. We all come from a very academic environment which sees publications as being important. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I set a, a KPI for Karen um, when she was his um, that to get two publications out a year. I don't think she mm. ever got less than seven. Wow. Um, <laughs> she was truly an extraordinary lady and uh, just wonderful. So following on from that theme, Terry Healy, who used to be the um, general counsel at CSIRO, has asked, how do you manage patents and other forms of intellectual property? With a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, so you do have a patent portfolio? We do, yeah. yeah. We, I, I, we have four patents. Um, yeah. But in addition to the patents we have, of course, we spend a lot of time looking at patents. Uh, right. when, whenever we get into a new product, we have to make sure that we know um, what's the environment that we're working in, yep. what's covered by patents, what isn't covered by patents. Uh, we have to know what we have to patent so that um, uh, we have access to it. We're still a relatively small company on a global scale. And sometimes we simply patent to, um, to, to be able to maintain that boundary for ourselves. Mm. You know, um, it's very it's very expensive to be fighting patents, mm. uh, fighting other people, but it's really important to maintain our right to operate. Um, so yep. yeah, and and um, you would have trademarks as well. Presumably. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah, we we have yep. um, many trademarks um, in. Well, all of our products are trademarked mm. um, in all of the. Um, 24 nations um, that we operate in. Um, so we have a lady um, that uh, works with patent attorneys, but her whole job is to mm. make sure that our our um, our trademarks and our domain names um, are protected. Are protected, and also our packaging. We we have been developing packaging, and we have packaging technologists. Do you we, have a design we, right? 
we have we we have design yeah. rights over yeah. and we have a terrific a, a, a bottle that we call the petal bottle um you uh, people who might yeah. know qv may have seen it um but it allows you to pump a cream um and that's really important because a lot of people with atopic dermatitis have oh. staph aureus on the skin the staph aureus is associated <laughs> with the really cause of atopic dermatitis and it's you know to to be able to dispense that cleanly, a pump is very important. But we've de de designed a very um, cost-effective bottle um, that um, has a cone base, um, but then the cone base is, is um, presented in, in a sort of like a petal base, um, but entirely done um, to meet a need um, and uh, Australian designed, and it's been a huge success, uh, and particularly a great success in the UK, where those products are, are on the NHS and are available in hospitals. Um, so it's very, very important um, to have a hygienic way of dispensing a cream if you're in a hospital, because you know that you don't want cross contamination between the different patients. Now, Kwong Lim has asked, um, says, fantastic video. Um, thank you, Jane. He says, as an Australian skincare company, what is your approach towards collaboration and partnerships with other firms, both here and abroad? Uh, he's better than abroad. <laughs> the, um... why, why? Why is he better than abroad? Well, um, oh, just in terms of control, I guess. Um, but uh, partnerships with other firms... Um, we partner uh, with the universities and, um, well, I guess other firms. Um, the, the, some of the companies that do our testing for us are, 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 are companies that are specialised in that. Uh, we prefer to use Australians wherever possible, uh, but some of those companies are overseas companies. And uh, I remember doing a, um, one of the first trials on deodorants um, mm. with a company in the UK. I remember working um, with um, uh, the University of Leeds at one stage to do a vasoconstrictor trial. Um, there's a company in the US that does a lot of um, sunscreen testing and uh, claim substantiation. So we partner with those sorts of companies. Um, yeah. But, what leads um, you to select one company over another? Well, we do due diligence and we make sure that they know what they're doing. Mm. Um, we make sure that they're the best in class. Right. Um, we prefer Australian. Uh, if we can possibly find an Australian company to do it, we would prefer to work with. Is that just because it's easier dealing with somebody close by or someone who we're, you... we're a bit loyal. <laughs> <laughs> I think that it's, yeah. it's I, I see it as an extension of manufacturing in yeah. Australia. I think that, you know, we really want to do everything we can to um, make sure industry and employment stays in Australia, you know, as, as far as possible, you know, at some, and I think, you know, the fact that we, we prefer local manufacturers of bottles is just an extension of our, you know, desire to be an Australian manufacturer. We want to see manufacturing stay in Australia for our children and our children's children. And, um, so I've got a few more questions. Jen, uh, Chen Chin said, thank you very much for your presentation. Very inspirational. How, what is the biggest challenge transitioning from being a research scientist to an immunologist? Uh, uh, immu sorry, a research scientist to industry, given you had an immunology background. Yeah, What's that's it? right. Um, so many years ago now. Um, the, um, what would have been? I think... Um, for me, it was a transition. I was a bench scientist, and I never right. got into a management. I, I was a postdoc, so I was doing I was doing everything for myself. Uh, when I moved to industry, um, I moved into management. So uh, there was a lot I had to learn, um, and uh, I I used to go and do one management course, one course um, to sort of like pick up all the the management skills that I needed. I did one course every year. So I used to try and do one course in management and one course in a technical area. Um, for instance, I was a biochemist, but I wasn't a microbiologist. And I really felt that I needed 
um, much more microbiology knowledge. So I actually went back to Monash and I did um, third year microbiology. Um, very just a, just a unit here and there, not a, not a full yeah. degree. No, well, I had a science degree, so, yeah, so I just didn't did, need it. I just did third year microbiology. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, the universities are now rolling out what they call micro credentials, which is yeah. probably would would speak to your need perfectly. Great idea. Just, yeah, just rather great. than a whole three yeah. year shebang. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that'd be perfect for you know, for for instance, R and D R and D chemists. You know, might do a, mm. if it was available a micro credential in. Uh, colloid science, you know, would be be very helpful. Um, in fact, you know, there, there's a lot of similarity between what we do in the paint industry, and it's all about colloids. But you know, but then you know, um, there's so many so many um, MBA type degrees where you know I remember doing a marketing um, uh, unit at one stage just so that I could talk the same language as our marketing people. Um, I spent a lot of time going to sales conferences and presenting um, of science to our salespeople, but that was very useful in terms of sort of understanding yeah. the sales perspective, you know, just spending time with our sales team. I still love doing that. I, I, I love going to all our overseas markets and um, it's been just wonderful mm. uh, to see to, to have a reason to tour a country, yeah. um, but then you also get all the cultural things and uh, seeing all the beautiful mosques in the Middle East has just been absolutely wonderful, just as an example. So Bill Scales has a question. He says, great presentation. How does your continuous improvement process work? Well, it continue, it continue. Just, just tell you, Bill used to be the chairman of the Productivity Commission. So. Oh, right. Okay. Well, change um, and hopefully continuous improvement, there's not much point in change if it isn't for improvement, is just part of what we do. Um, and I have to say, it's one thing I'm really proud of at Ego, that we just simply accept change. Um, and in fact, what's come out of our... Um, uh, uh, engagement survey, um, the one thing that the whole of the company is working on is um, uh, simplify, simplify, simplifying process. Um, and, you know, when you think about it, you know, a, a simple process is, is a thing of beauty. It means that you truly understand the whole process and you've brought it down to, you know, the, the, the most straightforward mm. way of doing it. You know, so I think um, we we work very hard on that. We work very hard, well, and it's we work very hard on documenting everything we do. We have to because we're a pharmaceutical company. Um, but those um, disciplines that come out of um, being a pharmaceutical company, the fact that you've got to do everything right first time and it's got to be documented, those things really help you mm. um, to get a good a continuous improvement environment um, because you know there's every time something goes wrong your your the whole group is required to come together to look at what went wrong and how do you make sure that um, that doesn't happen again and things are moving forward and um, I, I love going around and walking around and seeing you know groups of um, you know groups of people engineers and scientists and and um, supply chain people all with their heads together over a problem in a room. And I think, you know, that's, it really makes my heart warm when I see that. And, um, yeah. So, so is continuous improvement a bottom up thing or top down or externally coming externally or how, how does it happen? How does it happen? Um, I, I think it's a whole of engagement thing. You know, if there is a problem, if there is a um, what we call a deviation, that deviation has to be closed out, right? So the the people involved in that need to get together, um, and I think the role of the managers is simply to empower um, that whole team to work together to get a better process to make sure that that problem doesn't happen a second time, and that means um, and the, the the other advantage is. Because all of our processes are documented, that's a great start. It means that you've got something solid 
anyone can improve on something that's already written. You know, you've got, you've got a point of communication. Um, so I often say to people, and it's not our scientists and engineers, I think they accept documentation very well, but sometimes when we get um, people like accountants or people uh, from marketing or business um, forces that join our team and we need the broad range of it, um, I explain the whole process of writing standard operating procedures and the fact that you know, it's, it's the way we communicate with each other. We get it down on paper, then we all have the facts in front of us and everybody can contribute to the improvement of that. When a process isn't written down, then everybody's guessing and, and you mm. can't really interact in the same way. So. Fantastic. So we have a question here from David Painter. How much of ego successes do you put down to the ability of the family company to invest long term rather than being beholden to the stock market? Oh, absolutely. I, I think that um, Alan and I um, have been totally committed to ego um, and being able to put the profits back into the, the company and, and grow the company. And it's been a, a, just a joy um, to be able to do that and to see that us go from a small company to really, I think, are now an advanced manufacturing facility. Uh, to, I, 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 I have really enjoyed my working life and I think uh, I owe that to um, my husband and to him taking the philosophy from his family that we were here for the long term, we were here to grow and invest um, in the country. And uh, I really hope that it can be my legacy actually that I think that the bigger the company gets before I retire, the, the longer it will go on as a, as a mm. advanced manufacturing company because there will be a substantial footprint here. And um, So being a family company, did it mean that you could invest and suffer maybe low returns for a few years in the expectation that things would pick up? Right. Certainly, although I have to say we were never tested in that way. Right. Um, but, but you're prepared I, to do it. Well, yes, that's right. But in, yeah. in all the time that I've been here, we've had double digit growth. Um, and so our problem has been um, where to invest, what to invest in, making the sensible choices about the most important thing to, to invest in um, to keep growing the, um, the company. So uh, Chen Yu Chin has, also, has asked, how much R&D effort um, has, uh, ha, how, do, how has R&D changed over the years? Has it gone up, down, or has it been pretty steady? Or Well, as the company grows, uh, we continue to increase our R&D team. Um, uh, we, um, we, we, from the very early days, I think we were putting out um, for new, you know, new products plus reformulated products. Um, today, we're probably putting out between seven and ten uh, new products and reformulated products. Um, I think a lot of people wonder what the next product will be, and I just keep saying, "Don't worry, there's lots of ideas. We yeah. we haven't run out of ideas. Um, we we just um, yeah no, we always have a very long um, product." Um, development. Um. And, and a question from me, um, you know, the advanced manufacturing uh, capital equipment that you've got in your factory is very impressive. How would you rate it against some of the most advanced systems for producing all sort of products in the world? Well, uh, I remember um, we, uh, I went to Germany um, mm. And I visited the company that makes the mixers. Machines, yeah. Uh, yeah, the it, uh, it, the company is called uh, Zobatic. And uh, uh, when they showed us around, they had um, they were building uh, ten of the same type of mixers. We bought a two-ton one, um, mm. but they had ten um, that they were making for Unilever. Um, mm. at the time and they talked about their other customers being people like Glaxo and whatever. Mm. Um, I, we are buying um, the most advanced equipment um, that is going into these big companies. Yeah. I've, I've got no doubt about it. We, at the moment, we're, we have two of these two-ton mixers. At the moment, we're negotiating and we're actually building 
a facility right now um, mm. to um, accommodate a five ton mixer uh, with a three ton side vessel. And um, in that uh, video you saw of Dandenong, our, our future growth will be at our Dandenong site Mm. And our expectation there is that we will have a 10 ton mixer at that site. Right. So, you know, we're still a lot smaller than Unilever. And um, uh, so, you know, where they might have multiple um, 10 ton mixers, um, but we're getting there. <laughs> yeah. Terrific. Look, I think we've almost come to the end. Unless anyone, I don't know if anyone's put their hand up, um, but um, that's been a fascinating story about, the family business of how it's grown from from uh, you know it's only about fifty or sixty years old to where it is today. It's a really yeah. amazing story, and the growth rate you've you've been experiencing is phenomenal. Yeah, you know, it, really, it is. It's, it's great. I think it, it's a matter of just keeping everybody working together. <laughs> it is, and it's you, you're one of the hidden champions. You know, mm, you, thank you. Yeah. You, uh, and so congratulations and congratulations on your award. Thank you very much, everyone um, who's, who's logged into the webinar. And um, we, look, we, hope, we hope to see you in person one day. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone. Thank Good night. Good night. Mm -hmm.